This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neurology Podcast. I'm Matthew Harms, a practicing ALS neurologist at Columbia University, and it's my privilege today to be able to focus on an exciting paper coming from the ALS literature that's now published in neurology titled Respiratory Strength Training in ALS, a Double-Blind, Randomized, Multi-Sham Controlled Trial. Here to talk with me today is Emily Plowman from the University of Florida, where her team really is leading the way in focusing on both bulbar and respiratory function in ALS. Uh, As many of you know, if you've seen ALS patients, it is often the respiratory decline and the bulbar function that ends up being the major determinant of survival. And so these are really especially important points for clinical care in this patient population. So it's a real pleasure to have you here today, Emily. Thanks for having me, Matthew. Your paper just came out and uh, focuses on using respiratory strength training in ALS. And so I was hoping you might share the main points and methodologies of your paper. Firstly, just to backtrack to let you know like what motivated our work in this area. We've been, from a broadly speaking standpoint, traditional sort of ALS models of care have been primarily palliative and reactive in nature, uh, whereby interventions have been applied after and in response to clinically identified impairment thresholds. So, for example, as you know, the use of mechanical insufflation, exufflation, or or cough assist has been routinely prescribed in the United States once a critical impairment threshold whereby peak cough flow hits 270 liters per minute. And so the actionary way then all of a sudden this cough assist device is prescribed to the patient. And this historical reactive model of care is really disease centric. And what I mean by that is that the unknown and sometimes unpredictable ALS disease progression, in addition to a clinician's ability to identify those impairments, which as you all know, sometimes access to care can be an issue, particularly with uh, the recent COVID pandemic. And so it really leaves the the patient and the family sort of helpless and at the the mercy of this sort of unpredictable ravaging disease. And we've been thinking in our group here at the University of Florida for some time that we know that there is unfortunately the eminent development of dyspnea, dysphagia, and dystocia or or cough impairment. And so the historical model, reactionary model, doesn't take advantage of potentially the early ability to improve physiologic capacity and and functional reserve for vital functions such as breathing, airway clearance, and and oral intake. And so our line of work in this area is largely born out of a, a desire to examine if a proactive approach that flips this model a bit on its head And rather than the disease dictating models of care, the patient is educated as best we can with what we currently know. And then it empowers them to make a decision early in the the disease, but this is specifically for early affected individuals with ALS. I'm thinking about the fact that when patients come to see me and they have limb weakness, very quickly say, you know, a toned fit muscle will decline less quickly So definitely organize your life so that you're keeping muscles that are strong, fit, and toned. I guess I don't have the tools or haven't thought about ways to make that happen for bulbar or respiratory muscles. And is that what you're getting at with this training? As we all know, you know, use it or lose it. And we're reminded of it when we go to the gym and it takes us a while to build up nice muscle tone and strength. But the minute you stop doing that, unfortunately, it it tends to go away. And so the broad approach here is to actively engage muscles and and strength and physiologic reserve, specifically that do target cough and airway clearance capacities, and then also breathing and hoping to stave off like respiratory insufficiency, which, you know, as we know, is the leading cause of death in individuals with ALS. So start off by walking us through how you picked your intervention, what it looked like, kind of what an average participant would experience doing these exercises and trainings that your study focused on. We screened 51 individuals with ALS across two sites at the University of South Florida in Tampa and the University of Florida in Gainesville. And we enrolled 45 early affected individuals with ALS. And I would like to specify that these patients and the inclusion criteria, they had to have 
a force vital capacity that was greater than or equal to 70% predicted. So that's a very important point to, to make out when we're talking about our findings, that these don't generalize to every individual with ALS. In addition, their ALS functional rating scale revised needed to be 34 or higher. And we specifically targeted this group, Matthew, because we do speculate that there's this critical window of time in which engaging in these proactive exercises could be beneficial to pump up the bank account, so to speak, or the savings account, which is sometimes how I describe it to patients, which unfortunately they will decline, but we're just sort of trying to boost up their physiologic capacities. Similar to what folks may do before undergoing a surgery, they may be told that they need to physically get fitter or perhaps lose weight to give themselves the best post-operative outcomes. But in this way, we're increasing their physiologic reserve and bumping up that curve of which they'll then unfortunately decline. But we're very interested to see, given the nature of the the terminal illness and the importance of breathing airway clearance and swallowing for survival, if this could have a functional impact. And really the first question was, is it feasible? You know, is it safe to do a respiratory strength training program? And then secondly, can we increase maximum inspiratory and maximum expiratory pressures which are the latter being very important for cough and airway clearance and the the former being, we would think, very important for saving off respiratory insufficiency. Tell us what the training looked like, what it consisted of, and then tell us what you found in the results. The training specifically, as I mentioned earlier, we, we call it RST or respiratory strength training. And our protocol involves both expiratory and inspiratory sets of exercises and um, typically, historical programs have just focused on one or, or the other. For this, individuals were enrolled in our study. They underwent baseline testing, and then they were randomized you know, to either go into the active respiratory strength training group or the sham training group. It's really important for this to be practical for the patients. So we, they did the therapies at home. And we sent a home therapist out one day a week. In the past, when we had our pals come into clinics, we would get a lot of drops because, you know, it's just too much of a burden on them. And so that's an important component. They would complete their exercises five days a week. And it consisted of using two different trainers, one, like I mentioned, for the expiratory muscles and the other for the inspiratory muscles. And these are one-way spring-loaded pressure threshold devices where a patient either blows into the trainer for the expiratory repetitions or they breathe in through the trainer for the inspiratory repetitions and they have to, to successfully complete a repetition. They actually have to blow through this pressure threshold device. We can, much like going to the gym and, and doing weight-bearing exercises, we can actually load the inspiratory and expiratory muscles with these one-way calibrated spring-loaded devices. So we specifically, for this trial, loaded the muscles at a 30% individualized load for the expiratory and inspiratory systems. Um, It's sort of important to point out here that historical load-bearing exercise programs that follow sports medicine principles will progressively load the muscles and typically starting around 60% of their one rep max, moving up to 70 or perhaps even 80%. Given that this is a progressive and terminal disease that includes muscle wasting, one very important point is that we don't want to overtax or overload the muscles. So they did daily 25 repetitions of their expiratory repetitions and 25 repetitions of their inspiratory repetitions. So folks did this for a 12-week period. They had weekly home therapy visits whereby a therapist would retest their inspiratory and expiratory maximum pressures and recalibrate the trainers so that they were always at that 30% load. And then following their completed 12-week exercise program, they attended the the laboratory here at UF and completed their post-RST assessments. And then we also looked at one-year functional outcomes um, for time to referral to non-invasive ventilation, looking at both their bulbar subscale and total ALS decline rates over uh, the 12-month period, and then also their oral feeding status. And if I understand from your paper correctly, you found that doing this training was associated with improvements in some metrics and no change in other metrics. Can you walk us through that aspect of the results? We specifically noticed for our short-term outcomes and our primary outcomes that the program led to an immediate physiologic improvement 
in maximum expiratory pressures as well as cough function. However, it didn't affect maximum inspiratory pressures or forced vital capacity. When we looked at our functional one-year outcome data, we noted that the ALS FRSR bulbar subscale decline rates were attenuated for individuals in the active RST group and specifically those in the sham group, their slope or monthly average decline rate was almost three times higher or faster than those in the active group. I would like to point out because, you know, when we publish these papers, there's a lot of heavy reliance on statistical significance. But what we found to be highly relevant and meaningful to the patients in this trial was that although at the beginning of this study, all patients were able to eat orally by mouth some form of of intake, When we looked at our one-year, 12-month outcome data, 87% of individuals in the active group were still consuming an oral diet compared to only 64% of individuals in the sham group. And so we found that to be clinically quite meaningful to those patients. And then the, the other thing I'd like to point out that potentially could be missed by the statistical significance, but although our survival analysis didn't denote any significant differences for timing of NIV referrals across group. Um, If you looked at data on the 14 participants who did commence non-invasive ventilation, on average, those in the active group commenced NIV 12 months later than those in the sham group, suggesting that perhaps respiratory function was preserved for a bit longer in these participants. Do you have another trial in mind? And how would you do things differently based on what you learned from this I think, you know, the key is we need to increase uh, and do this across other sites. Like a lot of studies, this in some senses uh, raises more questions than answers. And so something that we noted here in this particular trial was we, we believe there could be a bit of a dose response in terms of the loading that we're putting on the muscles. Further work needs to look at, well, what is the actual ideal load that we would want to place on the muscles to maybe induce or optimize physiologic gains in function in early affected patients? We really need to figure out, you know, what are the key sort of ingredients to optimize this in which patients and at what dose? I, for one, would love to see these types of studies funded more. Um, I'm sure you and your lab would also. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> I do have the, I do have the sense though that these types of interventions, although not as attractive uh, to funding agencies as antisense oligonucleotides or interventions that are you know molecularly driven, are really important and are getting some traction. This is very low tech. It's very easy to disseminate because the trainers that one can use for this are typically in the order of like fifty dollars for patients that mm-hmm. they can even order them themselves. They can be trained. We, we've recently done studies using telehealth as well with you know, the necessity to do this during the pandemic. But I do think it's starting to get traction. And I'll be honest with you, I do agree. Like I've always felt these more disease, hard hitting, basic molecular studies would get more traction. But I recently had the fortune of being, as I know you were too, Matt, on the NINDS ALS Strategic Task Force to promote, you know, future directions for for funding. And I was part of the quality of life panel. And I'll be mm-hmm. honest, I sort of thought, oh, <laughs> No, people are not going to be, everyone's going to go take their lunch break during our session and there's going to be less interest in that. But I actually, I was pleasantly surprised. I found the opposite and I had a lot of people contact me afterwards. And so I do agree with you and I'm excited about this, that right now people are living with these diseases and, you know, what pals and their caregivers have, but they've taught me a lot, but what they also have shown me is, you know, the human spirit sort of needs a sense of purpose every day. And, you know, they also need a sense of hope and not to overstate this because this is sort of symptom modifying in the short term. So I want to be clear on that. But I have noted in hundreds of patients that I've done this with, even just in clinic, that when they know they have to get up every day and do their exercises and they have a purpose with that, there's also like a intangible sort of quality of life aspect to this, I think, that is really nice. And the fact that it empowers them to take control of one thing and they typically see improvements in their numbers. And when everything else is frankly sort of, you know, going down the tube, then this is like a really great thing for them. So, yeah. 
Well, fantastic. And really appreciate you taking the time today to talk to us about your paper, Respiratory Strength Training in ALS, a double-blind, randomized, multi-center, sham control trial. Obviously a mouthful of a title, but uh, need to fit all of that in there to convey what it does. That paper with Emily Plowman as the first author is now available in pre-publication in the journal Neurology. Thank you again for joining us today for the Neurology Podcast. We hope you check out other episodes on the webpage. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.